Thanks, Dennis. So, um, yeah, what I'm going to be talking about today is just some methodologies that we've been applying to understand crustal stress conditions throughout geologic time. Um, and I'm going to be uh, talking about those methodologies through some applied examples that we've been working on uh, on laramide deformation on the Colorado Plateau. Um, and this has been done uh, with my advisor, Amanda Hughes, and, and uh, George Davis on my committee. Okay, before I get started, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about myself. Um, so I grew up in a small town in Western Pennsylvania. Um, I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Pittsburgh. I got my master's from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, and as Dennis mentioned, I'm now a fourth year PhD candidate um, at the University of Arizona, and I should be graduating um, next May. My primary research interest it revolves around um, structural geology, but I'm also interested in regional tectonics and geomechanics. Uh, and Henry is my field companion, and you'll see him starring in a lot of the field photos throughout this talk. Um, so again, what I'm going to be talking about today is reconstructing paleo stress conditions from laramide deformation on the Colorado Plateau. And we're going to be doing this through a multi-method, multi-scale approach. Um, and then we'll go into the importance and implications for applying this type of methodology um, to understand paleo stress conditions within the Earth's crust. Uh, so a little bit about the background. So what's the problem? What are these methods trying to address? We're trying to better understand when, why, and how rocks deform. And we're doing this on two different scales. So we're trying to understand on the uh, regional scale, what's the regional tectonic stress that drives uh, orogenic processes and deformation. Um, and then looking more locally at, uh, at regions where that our field stress uh, different. And so we have like stress perturbations or locally uh, that vary from that far field stress state. And so when I'm talking about crystal stress, I'm looking at stresses within the Earth's crust that drive structural deformation or faulting and folding, um, and primarily looking at brittle deformation in this talk. Um, the style of deformation depends on temperature and pressure conditions, um, the magnitude of stress and the 3D stress field orientation. This little cartoon here is just trying to just uh, showing how when you change the orientation of your principal stresses, you can change your stress regime. So when your maximum principal stress is vertical, um, you're in an extensional stress regime and you expect to see normal faulting. Um, when sigma two or your intermediate principal stress is vertical, you expect to see strike slip faulting. And when sigma three is vertical, you're in a shortening environment um, and expect to see thrusting and reverse faulting. Um, so why does understanding the stress conditions within the Earth's crust matter? Um, so understanding the present stress condition and of modern time um, is important for active tectonics. It's important for um, carbon sequestration and nuclear waste storage applications and multiple applications in hydrocarbon and mineral exploration as well. Um, but understanding uh, paleo stress environments or past stress environments is important for, uh, has implications for tectonic processes as well as structural development. And also is important for relating stress environments to fluid to paleo fluid flow and mineralization processes. And so again, in this talk, we're going to be focusing on laramide deformation on the Colorado Plateau. Um, so the Colorado Plateau is outlined here in the pale yellow. The major laramide uplifts are roughly outlined in orange, and the paradox basin is shown in pink. And the style, the laramide deformation that we see uh, was driven by subduction of the Farallon plate beneath North America. And when that subduction started, there was a normal subduction. Um, and this was, this is what's called the severe orogeny, um, where you had normal subduction and the development of a thin skin fold and thrust belt that kind of bounds the Colorado Plateau and the development of a foreland basin. And we see that slowly transition into laramide style deformation where deformation propagated landward and you saw more big uh, basement cord uplifts um, and thick skin deformation. And this is again kind of uh, called the laramide orogeny. And although um, we talk about these as a severe laramide orogeny, there's kind of a temporal and spatial overlap here. Um, and, and I at least tend to think of it more as a structural style uh, where the severe, you have the thin skin fold and thrusting in the laramide, you have more of this thick skinned uh, basement cord uplifts as we see on the plateau. 
Um, so the Laramide deformation we see on the plateau, those basement cord uplifts are shown in green, uh, bound by their monoclines in green. Um, and so the, we see uh, primarily see the, the monoclines at the surface, um, at least on the plateau, it's not been exhumed enough to actually see the basement shear zone that has driven these uplifts. So what we observe is the deformed sedimentary cover. Um, and so what that looks like, uh, here's an example of one of these beautiful monoclines. This is the Hunter's Point monocline along the Defiance uplift down uh, near Gallup. Um, so you can see the, the flat, dipping, the uh, shallowly dipping back limb, um, and then the steeply dipping front limb. And the basement shear zone that controlled this structure is buried somewhere down here in this valley. We don't see it. Um, this is Comb Ridge. Um, so this is up in, in Utah. And this photo just does a really good job of showing how these, these monoclines trend along strike. Um, they're sometimes sinusoidal, but they can trend for a few hundred kilometers in, in length and can have up to two kilometers of structural relief. So what you're looking at here is kind of the, the chopped off head of the, the steeply dipping front limb. Um, and then you can see the, the, the beds folding back into that uh, shallowly dipping back limb. And then this is the, the synclinal hinge, which you don't see very often, but you see it really well uh, on the Zuni uplift just north of Gallup is where this photo was taken. You see the flat lying rocks here and then almost on a dime, they, they flip up to, to very steeply dipping, uh, dipping beds in the front limb. And then right in the middle of, of all these uplifts is the Paradox Basin. Um, the Laramide uh, deformation in the basin looks a little bit different than these big uplifts that we see elsewhere in the basin. There's no major uplift uh, that, by, that, that disturbs the basin. The monument uplift kind of plunges down into it. Um, but mostly what we see is uh, an, an amplification of the salt walls that previously existed. Um, so the Paradox Basin itself was deposited in Pennsylvanian time as a flexural foreland basin on the southwestern flank of the Uncompahgre uplift that was active um, as, an, as an ancestral mount, mount, Rocky Mountain uplift. And uh, by Cretaceous time, it was just being buried. So sediments were just being uh, flat wide, uh, deposited over top of the basin. And then um, during Laramide uh, deformation, those, those salt walls were amplified slightly. And so if you look at this cross section from A to A prime, uh, the Cretaceous uh, sediments are shown here in green. And so these would have been deposited horizontal. Um, and then there's just this slight, it's up to maybe like 15 degree dip on the flanks of these anaclines. Um, and that's attributed to uh, Laramide deformation. So later on in the top, We'll be looking at some um, deformed um, Jurassic sandstones uh, that were deformed during the Laramide uh, along the margin of one of these salt walls. And um, so this is just the image of, of, this, of Salt Valley. Um, so this is the outcrop that I'll be talking about later. And this is down in the valley. So because it's an exuded salt basin, the salt walls are now topographic valleys and the Mesozoic sediments uh, are dipping off, off the flanks of the valley and um, the Jurassic sandstone up here is what we're gonna be talking about later on. And so what's the approach to understand the paleo stress conditions that drove this deformation on the plateau? Um, we're gonna be taking kind of a multi-scale, multi-method approach to try to understand um, what the stress conditions were. Uh, so on the regional scale, we're gonna be utilizing mechanical and kinematical modeling, kinematic modeling approaches. I'm gonna integrating those with structural field constraints to understand what the far field uh, tectonic stress state might have been. And then on the local scale, we're gonna be utilizing uh, field-based fracture analysis um, tied with some geomechanical laboratory testing and mechanical modeling to understand how the, the, the Laramide far field stress varies um, in the Paradox Basin. So starting out here, uh, we use some kinematic modeling to try to in to try to determine what the geometry of the blind basement shear zones were. So this is a cross section along Comb Ridge monocline. Um, and we don't, we don't ever see the shear zone. Uh, so the topography here is this uh, kind of fine black line. Um, so all we see at the surface, um, if you remember that image or just, uh, just the deformed, uh, deformed sedimentary cover. So we can use tri-shear fault propagation folding 
um, to really nicely estimate uh, the, the geometry of the shallow part of the basement shear zone that would have created this fold. Um, and then we can use generalized area depth methods to extend that, uh, that interpretation to, to greater depths um, to try to get a good, under, a good estimation of what the blind basement shear uh, zone might look like. And we applied these two methods to a series of cross sections along each of the uplifts to try to uh, develop a three-dimensional fault uh, network uh, that would have been active during a laramide. And so uh, this is what that, that looks like. Um, so just to kind of get your bearings here, uh, what you're looking at in the right-hand side of the bottom photo is outlined here in uh, purple, the purple dashed line. And so uh, the faults underlying the uplifts um, are, were built by this uh, serial cross-sections across uh, the monoclinal trend. And this kind of colorful surface you're looking at is a digital structural elevation model um, along the base of the Cretaceous Dakota sandstone. Um, so I constructed this from uh, published structure contours, well logs, surface contacts, dip data um, to, to represent laramide deformation. So because the base Cretaceous uh, sandstone would have been subhorizontal when it was deposited um, in, on the plateau, and then it was subsequently deformed by laramide deformation, um, it really nicely kind of shows the structural relief patterns um, that were caused by laramide shortening. And so you see the structural highs in red and the structural lows in blue. And up here in the paradox basin, you see those kind of linear fold trends that follow uh, the salt walls. Um, these little blobs in here are uh, volcanic centers. So this is the Abajos, the Henrys, and, um, or sorry, these are the Abajos as well as the Sal's and um, the Henrys. And so uh, these would have, these appear as highs because the, they fold the Cretaceous sediments as they were intruded in. Um, but for the modeling, these were flattened out because they would have had deformation that happened post their um, mine. And so the idea with elastic uh, dislocation fault response modeling is once you get this 3D fault network, you can induce uh, various 3D uh, far field stress states and allow those stress states to drive slip on those faults. And you could observe deformation pattern on an overlying horizontal surface and then compare and get a best fit uh, modeled uh, deformation pattern to the deformation pattern that we observed. And so here are a couple of results from the, from the model. And you'll notice for now the paradox basin up in this corner just kind of exit out because the salt and mechanical complications with the salt, um, we, just, we just are excluding that from this part. Um, so what we're testing here is we're testing the regional 3D stress state. So each one of these models uh, had a far field stress state that was oriented at 45 degrees. And all that was changed was inducing a 3D stress state where we're changing the relative magnitude of sigma two. And we can see that the modeled uh, deformation patterns are, are sensitive to uh, the 3D stress state. We can also see that the model is sensitive to changing the orientations of stress. So here, uh, on the left-hand side, we're looking at working with the 2D stress state where sigma three is equal to sigma two. Um, and we're just rotating sigma one from zero to 45 to 90. And you can see the model is sensitive to that uh, rotation in the stress field. Um, and interestingly, when you're working with a 3D stress field, that sensitivity kind of systematically goes down. Um, so the model, you still see some sensitivity to um, changing the orientation of stress. But as you induce a, a relative magnitude of sigma two, um, the model appears to be less sensitive to changing the orientation of um, your sigma one. And so the idea is that once you run all of these scenarios, so all of the uh, different orientations of sigma one and the 3D stress ratios, you can do a structural similarity to try to figure out the best fit uh, for the uh, structural relief patterns that we see. And um, so what I'm presenting now is just based on structural relief. And based on that, it looks like the best fit for a laramide far field stress state would have had sigma one oriented at 60 degrees azimuth with a stress ratio of 0.25. 
Um, and, and this could also be, have, um, you can use other constraints uh, as well, like local paleo stress indicators um, to, to be additional constraints in your model. But so far, this is just with um, structural relief. Um, so uh, moving into the paradox basin, um, we, we see some, some indications in the fracture networks around these salt walls that the Laramide far field stress condition doesn't really make sense for the deformation patterns that we're seeing. And so um, zooming in, so just stuck again. Um, okay, so uh, what we're using here is along the margin of, of the salt walls, we're looking at conjugate shear fractures as stress indicators. So conjugate shear fractures are good indicators for stress, um, especially the 3D configuration of stress. So if you're sure what you're looking at is kind of a synchronous conjugate shear fracture pair and was formed in a, in a single representative stress state, um, then sigma one must bisect the acute angle, sigma three must bisect the obtuse angle, and sigma two tracks the intersection line. You can get a really good handle on your orientation of principal stresses once you nail down that you're that you're confident that you're looking at true conjugates um, that are representative of a single state of stress. You can also determine stress magnitude um, from uh, conjugate shear fractures if you're looking at a stress condition with relatively low differential stress states. I'm not going to go too much into that in this talk um, for the sake of time, but if you have any questions about that, feel free to or if you're interested, feel free to um, ask me more about that. Um, so what we're looking at here, so we're on the northern margin of Salt Valley. Um, so this is kind of the salt wall region here with a bounded normal fault. It's like a bit uh, that's bounding the outcrop of the Mesozoic sediments. And so we're looking at a single homogeneous um, Jurassic sandstone, the Moab tongue member of the Entrada formation. And we're looking at conjugate shear fractures um, within that unit with distance from this outcrop bounding normal fault. And what we can see in the conjugate shear fracture pattern is a, a, is a couple of different trends. Um, so right up next to the salt wall, we see really acute conjugate shear fractures that have a normal orientation. Um, so sigma one bisects the acute angle, so it's vertical here. And as we start stepping across, we see the conjugate uh, dihedral angle increasing. Um, and we also start to see a change in stress regime um, from normal to strike slip. So we see that uh, sigma one starts rotating out to a horizontal position as we get further from that outcrop bounding normal fault. And so uh, what that, the significance of that is up next to the fault, we're in a normal uh, extensional environment. As we step further away, we're in a strike slip environment. Um, but we would expect, um, because these were deformed um, during Laramide shortening, uh, we would expect them to be representative of a far field Laramide stress state. So why do we see this kind of transitional stress regime um, and what is causing the stress perturbation from the far field stress? Uh, so is it, this out, is it this normal fault? Was it active at the time creating kind of a stress shadow away? Is it the presence of the salt? Um, so we went uh, towards doing some more modeling to see uh, what, what might be causing this stress uh, pattern. And so to do the modeling, we had to build a, a, a restored 3D model. So uh, made a series of cross sections, uh, detailed cross sections centered around our map area um, and restored them back to Laramide time uh, with the goal of constructing uh, 3D model of what this area looked like. So you have the underlying salt wall. Um, the DEM here is kind of transparent. So you can see the outcrop I was working on is, is popping out above the DEM. Um, this this uh, kind of pale purple color is the Moab tongue member of the Entrada. Um, and so what we can do is put this in a mechanical modeling tool called FAST, which is the fault analytical stress tool. Um, where we input the data as, as uh, faults or dislocation surfaces and observation grids. And we can look at uh, stress perturbation patterns and predicted fra fracture networks um, and, see, and see if that matches what we're observing in the field. 
And so what, what we are driving stress, we use our far field layer high stress state that we've determined uh, that I talked about previously as the far field state of stress. And we tested different scenarios of, of letting the fault be active, letting the salt amplify and looking at deformation patterns that result. Um, and you can plot kind of fracture orientations um, from the predicted resulting stress perturbation. And we're able to see a really similar pattern. Um, actually the best pattern we get is when we simultaneously let the salt uh, grow and the fault be active. Um, and we get a really similar uh, pattern of stress regimes where it's normal right up next to the, to the fault and it transitions into a reverse uh, state of stress further away. Um, so again, here we're kind of integrating our field-based approach uh, with building structural framework and mechanical modeling, and we're using this mechanical modeling and testing it back again. So it's kind of an iterative process um, to understand what is going on and what's causing that stress perturbation away from the far field laramide stress state. Okay, so final remarks. Uh, what can we, what problems can we address with these? Our goal is to get insights on paleo stress. Um, the mechanical modeling methods can test various far field stress conditions um, to find the best fit tectonic stress. Um, we can also simulate stress perturbations from active faults and internally uh, deforming salt bodies and, and uh, potentially you know, igneous intrusions and, and things like that as well that might be altering stress field. Um, kinematic modeling is used to constrain structural geometries and for structural reconstructions. And our stress indicative field methods um, give us a direct indication of paleo stress and also is used to constrain our models. And again, we care about this um, because uh, it's important to understand how crustal stress relates to rock failure because faults and fractures are conduits for fluid flow. Um, and that has important implications in carbon and nuclear storage, hydrocarbon exploration, hydrology, mineralization, um, also has, uh, has um, meaning for active tectonics and for just the broader understanding of geologic processes such as tectonic processes and um, structural development. So yeah, thanks for tuning in. And yeah, I guess just put questions in the chat for now and, and I'll be available to answer questions after Aton. I just want to thank Lauren so much. You know, I don't see any questions at this time. If you have questions for Lauren, uh, you know, get them to Mike. He'll get them to Lauren. <laughs> anyway, let's go with Aton. And, uh, you know, he also is a uh, PhD candidate at the University of Arizona, uh, hoping to finish his work and. Uh, 2025 and uh, you know he too works on the Colorado Plateau so Aton why don't you carry it off all right thanks Dennis okay all right can everyone see that now okay I'm gonna assume it's a yes all right yeah. Uh, well, thanks again for having me. Um, just to reiterate, my name is Aton. Uh, and uh, for this presentation, I'm going to be quickly going over um, the stuff I did as part of my master's degree, uh, also at the University of Arizona, uh, working with people like Mark Barton, Isabel Barton, and another graduate student, Molly Radwini. But the title of uh, what I did as part of my master's uh, is called uh, Characterization of Uranium and Vanadium Deposits in the LaSalle District of Utah and Colorado and their relationship to paradox space and fluid flow. So um, this photo here is just uh, one of the photos I got from uh, being underground in some of the, the other uranium and vanadium districts in the area, but still relevant to uh, and similar to what I've been working on so far. And uh, although I don't have uh, photos of my field partners in here, uh, like Lauren did, I do have one watching this video remotely, uh, and I'd like to thank him for helping me out in the field. Okay. So before diving into all the nitty gritty stuff, I thought in the spirit of uh, Harold Courtright and uh, him being an economic geologist, I want to point out the importance of uh, the commodities that I'll be discussing, those being uranium and vanadium. Um, both of which are really important uh, as we try to 
transition into a greener economy. Uh, in the case of uh, vanadium, these things are used in uh, vanadium redox batteries, uh, which can store essentially uh, limitless uh, uh, energy in, in large uh, uh, storage areas. And then in the case of uranium, uh, of course, everyone knows it's uh, used as a nuclear fuel, uh, non-carbon based, uh, which has a lot less uh, emissions associated with it. Um, and in the case of uh, deposits on the Colorado Plateau, these two metals occur together. Uh, it's, it's unique. Uh, you don't get that everywhere else in places like uh, the Texas coastal plains or Nebraska, or Wyoming. Um, and then uh, these plateau deposits have been studied for a long time. Uh, one of these studies uh, I've had, I have a figure from in the right uh, part of the slide here. Uh, this is from uh, some work by Dan Shaw done in the 1950s and 60s and then synthesized later on in the early 2010s. Um, but this is what these ore bodies look like out there. Uh, you've got a small scale bar on the bottom. 100 feet and gives you an idea of what these tabular things look like. So uh, Lauren did a good job of talking about uh, uh, what the Paradox Basin is, but just to reiterate, um, this is where the LaSalle District sits in, uh, Pennsylvania in age, uh, Forland Basin, um, and it's restricted marine setting, create a lot of salt, a lot of evaporite deposition in the area. And uh, has made it a pretty premier study area for salt tectonics, uh, which we now see as these great salt cord anticlines uh, in these valleys that trend northwest, southeast, um, that we can see in panel B here. Uh, and it's also host to a whole bunch of different natural resources that includes things like oil and gas, uh, copper, manganese, and of course, uranium and vanadium. Uh, and these, these uranium vanadium deposits are hosted in things like the Triassic Chin Li formations and the uh, Jurassic Morrison formations, uh, the most well known of which uh, is found in the Yerevan mineral belt, which I've put in a box here and we'll zoom in now. Um, so this belt is this arcuate trend uh, that is outlined here. And perpendicular to that outline in this box is the LaSalle district, which is this uh, roughly 30 kilometer stretch of, of land that uh, is underlain um, and also outcropping uh, ore deposits. Uh, in this case, in the salt wash member of the, of the Morrison formation. And uh, these deposits are actually elongate parallel to the trend of the district, as well as following the trend of uh, a paleoflow indicators as well, things like uh, cross baiting and four sets and whatnot. So that mineralization is part of a long and complex uh, uh, fluid flow history that's found within Paradox Basin. Um, and by characterizing uh, what's going on with the uranium and vanadium, uh, as well as the associated alteration in the district, the goal was to try to place these events in the context of the entire basin's history. And we do that by asking ourselves uh, questions like, how have the, the different superimposed hydrothermal systems influence one another? Uh, what are the formation mechanisms for the different ore and gang minerals? Um, and what is the relative timing of these different mineral forming events? Uh, we can do that by looking at cross-cutting relationships and, and different growth textures. And of course, LaSalle is a fantastic place to be doing this. Um, Many people, I'm guessing, have been up on the Colorado Plateau where you have these beautifully incised canyons where you can see the stratigraphy all over the place and very little vegetation. So it gives you a chance to actually look at the rocks instead of being bothered by uh, vegetables. Uh, so jumping into what the district looked like, this is the geologic map of the area. Um, and then outlined with that dashed line is the LaSalle district. Uh, continues over a little bit. Um, to the east where it runs into the Paradox Valley and things are truncated. Um, but the westernmost extent is defined by the location of the Rattlesnake Mine. Uh, the easternmost extent is in the canyon itself, uh, which was last studied in detail in the 1950s and 60s by Carter and Walteri. And then the land in the middle uh, is currently owned um, or controlled by Energy Fuels Incorporated, where they've done quite a bit of uh, drilling themselves and also 
incorporated a bunch of uh, old drilling uh, on their land. Uh, the last of which was done in 2019, uh, where there were 20 drill holes. Um, and then these were logged as part of this study. But zooming in on that box in the center portion, um, we can see, uh, well, this is the land that Energy Fuels controls. And uh, we can see how extensive uh, their drilling has been and the prior companies joined that have been out there. So the points in yellow um, uh, have a graduated scale for foot grade. Uh, it's a pretty common metric in the mining industry, and it just helps to illustrate where ore is or was uh, prior to being mined out in the subsurface. And also, it really nicely shows the trend of mineralization. It's that east-west trend here. Um, uh, mirrors what's going on in the whole district. Um, but it also highlights like these old paleo channels that were part of the, the uh, fluvial salt wash member of the Morrison Formation. Uh, so you've got things like tributaries here. You can see little bends or meanders in this river system. It's really, really cool. Um, but zooming in a little more uh, in this white box here, that's where uh, uh, the most recent drilling was done uh, and where those holes were drilled that were logged as part of the study. And so in logging these holes, uh, I was able to describe uh, a lot of the macroscopic geologic features, uh, visible at least with the, uh, with the hand lines. Um, and these include things like concretionary cements, the presence of uh, thrown carbonates, presence of pyrite and quartz overgrowths, uh, basic lithology, uh, and discoloration, such as bleaching, and of course, the mineralization. Um, and there appears to be a pretty intimate relationship between the bleaching that we see at LaSalle and then the black uh, mineralized rocks that we can see in this core box here and also enlarged a bit over here. Um, so those, those bleach rocks are separated uh, by this impermeable mudstone layer here. So you've got the bleached white sandstone separated from this less altered pink sandstone. And then in between those two, you have this originally red mudstone bleached to this really interesting mint green color. And again, I've zoomed in on that uh, or I've enlarged that with these two uh, pieces of core here, where you can see what these things once look like and what they look like now following bleaching. Uh, and it, it really begs the question is like, what is happening? Why are there fluids bleaching what part, parts of this rock and leaving others out? And it really seems like these impermeable layers are the things sort of funneling fluids through uh, into the white units that we see and leaving things relatively untouched in the, in the pinks. But the Paradox Basin, of course, is known for the spectacular exposure of bleached white rocks against uh, uh, red rocks. Uh, and then another question rises of whether these styles of uh, bleaching are found throughout the, the basin or the same. Um, and the answer is they're probably not. There's a huge range of, uh, of uh, I guess, character of fluids out there this being one of them. So I put up here um, a fence diagram of what the mineralized holes look like. So out of the 20 that were drilled, uh, only four contain considerable amounts of mineralization in them. And it gives you a nice cross-sectional view of uh, what's going on. And interestingly, it's also along the trend of mineralization. You've got this little box here showing uh, the holes spanning from a, a west to east sense. Um, so these holes show the I guess, locations of the mineralization, um, and it, it demonstrates that the the bodies um, are pretty discontinuous. We have so much in, in practice. Oh, we did blocking today. So First day blocking. It's okay. When they say this, okay. you're going to move. David, you would you mind muting yourself, David Boyer? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so uh, in addition to uh, the observation that these things are sort of placed chaotically, hard to correlate between, um, it, it is uh, in agreement with uh, previous observations that these, these uh, bodies are hosted in like the uppermost bench of the salt wash. 
So that's all that was penetrated with these with these drill holes. Um, so they are all contained within that uppermost bench. But the difference being that uh, they're not found at one precise horizon. These things are all over the place, um, which is in disagreement with uh, some of the earlier observations uh, that were made in 60 years ago. So going down in scale, um, in general, uh, we'll be going to this uh, photomicrograph in a moment. But just to summarize uh, some of the things that were observed early on and uh, are agreed upon with, uh, with my observations are the fact that uh, mineralization is associated with these thick units of sandstone. Uh, they're tens of meters thick. Uh, and they're, they're pretty commonly light colored. Uh, these things can be white, light brown, light gray. Um, and they're often overlain or underlain by less permeable mudstone units, which um, I showed an example of in the drill box, the core boxes a moment ago. And then lastly, uh, uh, there's a close association with carbonaceous material, um, which I've highlighted here um, in this uh, uh, thin section image. Uh, it shows a plant cell structure hosted in pore space and surrounded by uh, uh, uranium and vanadium minerals, these sort of elongate crystals uh, that you can see are growing along the boundaries, green boundaries. Um, and these generalizations that I've summed up here are, are largely true for the ore found in La Salle. Um, but even though the, the plant matter like this is spatially associated with mineralization, the locus appears uh, to be elsewhere and raises questions about some of the major controls on the ore formation. So even though this picture shows a, a close proximity uh, to ore minerals and, and plant matter, that relationship can't be replicated uh, on the scale of the cores. There's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. So this diagram is, uh, is just up here uh, to, to prime you for uh, some of the the petrography that's to come in a moment. Uh, but essentially what it does is summarize is the paragenesis or the relative uh, sequence of mineral forming events that uh, I observed and, and interpreted uh, in the LaSalle area. Um, and it's important to help us determine some of the relative chemical conditions that the, these sandstones experience between their deposition and what we see today. So I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, can see the scales at the bottom here give you an idea of how small these things are. Remember, we're looking at thin sections uh, to give us insight on larger scale things. These are actually really important to note. Um, so I'm just going to go in order of uh, some of the earlier events to later events. Uh, the first of which, of course, is the deposition of these sandstones. And then along the grain boundaries of these detrital quartz grains, uh, we see uh, hematite inclusion, which I pointed out here. Uh, and that's trapped between the original grain and then a quartz overgrowth that's uh, encapsulated it. And that represents the diagenetic reddening uh, associated with the breakdown of iron bearing minerals. Um, and due to uh, exposure to oxidized waters in these river systems, they break down into things like hematite and turn the rocks nice and red. Um, and then that is preserved uh, by that nice coating of quartz. Um, otherwise, that hematite would have been bleached uh, following uh, the influx of reducing fluids that would have turned it into things like pyrite or washed it out of the system completely. Then on the right side, uh, we can see a similar relationship between the ore minerals like uraninite and montrazite, where they're trapped as inclusions uh, between that uh, detrital quartz grain over here and then that quartz overgrowth along the outside of it. And because of uh, uh, I'm inferring that uh, these things uh, have roughly the same timing as things like uh, the transition of hematite into pyrite, they're probably uh, intimately associated with the bleaching. This is just another um, uh, argument to, to support that. So the next stage of mineral formation uh, includes uh, Vanadium sheet silicates like vanadium illite, uh, which comes in, in two forms. The first of which is shown here on the left. Uh, it's, it's got potentially this detrital clay component to it. See those nice interlocking grains 
um, that you don't see over here in this hairier looking uh, vanadium illite that probably is, is more orthogenic and formed in open pore space as opposed to this kind of thing um, where you have simple octahedral substitution of vanadium into the, into the crystal structure to get it to uh, really be a vanadium illite as opposed to this, which was always incorporating it, no substitution involved. Um, and this kind of thing probably formed at the expense of uh, quartz. You can see that it's got those raggedy edges along it where there's probably some corrosion and dissolution associated with formation of these younger minerals. Uh, those uh, vanadium illites are also uh, coeval with the formation of other sheet silicates like chlorite. You can see here there's this quartz grain with a nice rind of that green colored chlorite on the edges. Um, and then encompassing that is these nice rhombohedral uh, carbonates that are growing around it and giving us an idea of the relative um, uh, age relationships between the two. And those carbonates actually come in a couple of different forms at, at the least. Uh, the first of which is this nice pure calcite here. Uh, it's pretty inclusion free relative to this, this ferron dolomite that's overgrown it. Uh, it's got all this, these uh, ratty looking features to it um, that probably are uh, inclusions of uh, some of the fluids that might've been out there. Um, and then you see that similar uh, overgrown texture between those carbonates and, and the clay cements like kaolinite here, where you have it overgrowing these nice euhedral uh, ROMs of that carbonate. And some of the relationships uh, with the carbonates and other minerals are somewhat ambiguous, uh, but that timing relationship is how I've interpreted these textures. So following the precipitation of kaolinite and other clays, uh, we get dissolution of, uh, of minerals like feldspar, where they're losing a lot of the alkali component to them and turning into these like, ghost-like features. Um, and their intact grain boundaries that we see out here are pretty indicative of the fact that kaolinite uh, was there prior to the dissolution. Otherwise, the grain boundaries would be pretty distorted. And then on the right, we can see that uh, uh, kaolinite is... Uh, is intergrown with things like chalcedony, uh, a silica phase. It's almost like a rhythmic nature to it. We've got uh, an instance of chalcedony, then the kaolinite, chalcedony, and then repeat that process a few times. Last uh, but not least uh, was the late supergene event um, that created things like carnitite and tiamonite, these nice greens here. Um, and were probably formed under the same oxidizing conditions uh, that converted this pyrite back into hematite. You see how it, that hematite is enclosing in on and replacing uh, the pyrite there. Uh, so I'm putting this figure back up just to summarize all those things. Now you have a better idea of uh, what it is I'm describing with this figure. Um, and it shows how complex the fluid flow history is at LaSalle. I've also included some rough estimates for absolute timing of these things, such as the carbonate and clay stable alteration. Uh, these things you see all over the Paradox Basin, um, and, uh, and it's supported by studies that have related uh, these large reducing or bleaching events to hydrocarbon migration during some of the Laramide age burial um, that Lauren described earlier. So the fact that these products are all over the basin and also in LaSalle, uh, which suggests that uh, the timing there is probably the same as elsewhere, putting it at that uh, late Mesozoic or early Cenozoic timing. And then similarly, uh, supergene mineralization has also been described all over the uh, plateau, and it's probably related to the uplift of the plateau and uh, introduction of meteoric waters into the systems that remobilize things into these more oxidized states. So looking a little bit about at, uh, at some of the geochemistry of these minerals, uh, this first diagram here on the left uh, discriminates the differences between the vanadium illites and vanadium chlorides based on their potassium content. Uh, so the, as you can see in red, you've got uh, vanadium illites, which are truly potassium bearing phases. And then there's much less of that in these chlorides. 
Uh, there really shouldn't be any. They don't really fit in the crystal structure of chlorite, uh, but that would suggest that there's probably a mixture between the two and uh, also that there's probably intergrowth of them. And just for reference, I've included some points in here in white that show what some of the detrital clays look like. Uh, then we've got in these ternary diagrams here, um, it just shows sort of the vanadium enrichment in these vanadium elites compared to uh, the vanadium content in, in chloride. And we're actually able to date uh, what the, the timing of, uh, of when these vanadium elites formed. Uh, again, these are potassium bearing phases, so you can do potassium argon dating. Um, and we do that by separating the different size fractions, of course, to find um, the first three uh, size fractions actually producing an age that roughly clusters uh, in the Eocene. Um, and, uh, and that's actually an age that's pretty consistent with what a lot of my colleagues have gotten uh, on faulting, uh, as well as uh, other bleaching in the Paradox Basin. And then down here, we see this Pliocene age, uh, again, related to the uplift of the plateau. Um, and the, the potassium that supplied the, uh, that, that date was probably related or coming from these, uh, these carnitites that are also potassium bearing phases, but were formed much, much younger. So looked at uh, a lot of the minerals and a little bit about their chemistry. So briefly look at some of their isotopes. So I've got their measured values here for carbonates. Um, this is measuring uh, oxygen and carbon isotopes uh, uh, from different carbonates at LaSalle. Um, and that includes things like uh, those concretionary cements, um, uh, little interbedded limestones, uh, among other things. But uh, yeah, the, the spread in the, in the carbon values here probably suggests that uh, there might be a little bit of a light organic carbon mixed in uh, with, with a more uh, limestone, Paleozoic limestone signature as a source for the bicarbonate. Um, the spread in the values in oxygen uh, shows that there was a range in temperatures that they formed in, um, but without exact knowledge of their formation, it's difficult to tell exactly what those waters look like. Um, so to, uh, to get a rough estimate of what the isotopic signature of those waters were, we're able to back calculate uh, uh, what they look like over a range of things, over, over a range of temperatures from 25 to 100 degrees C. Um, and these, these temperatures are permissible and uh, certainly suggest that, uh, yeah, there's possibility of, uh, of uh, mixing of uh, conate waters or meteoric waters in this system. And just to uh, demonstrate that uh, really there is a, an organic component to, uh, to uh, the carbon isotopes here, the lightest value, which would be associated with the more organic rich bicarbonate source is, is uh, stable with this, these wood chips found in the, in the sandstones out there. So just to summarize everything, I'll try to be quick. Um, the altering fluids out there uh, were probably focused and funneled uh, by impermeable mudstones, as well as some of the uh, primary depositional features out there, including things like the trend of the channels as well as smaller scale things like cross bedding. Uh, the mineralization represents a small localized uh, event in, in the context of a larger uh, basinal fluid flow that precipitated other things like carbonates and clays. Um, it's related, the mineralization is related to a, an early bleaching event that differs from some of the things that I've had colleagues date that were probably a hundred million years after the fact. And then based on the isotopes uh, that I showed before, there's evidence for fluid mixing, which might have been one of the mechanisms for ore formation out there. Um, but uh, I, I can't thank AGS enough for uh, providing me funding uh, for more field work to come in LaSalle. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of mapping out there uh, using a, a, a method called the anaconda style, uh, where we basically have a, a base layer of lithology, uh, an example of which is shown here, and then overlaying on top of that are things like hydrothermal alteration 
and uh, mineralization. And this kind of thing has been done on the plateau before uh, by people like Nielsen and Chan, who have uh, mapped bleaching related to various structures out there. And I'm going to be doing this at two different scales, uh, the first of which will be during May underground. Uh, we've got uh, access to these underground workings uh, for the entire month, which is fantastic. Um, give me a chance to do mapping of continuous exposure for roughly six and a half kilometers. And then I'll be comparing that to uh, things at the surface over in LaSalle Canyon, where we know there are other superimposed hydrothermal systems that might have influenced uh, uh, one another. And again, I'd like to thank everyone that was involved in this project and uh, thank AGS. So with that, I think I'm done and can take questions. Sorry for going kind of long here. Hey, can you see the uh, written questions in, in the chat window? All if right, not, yeah. Anthony uh, Hammond has one for you. Okay, so the first question is about the vanadium to uranium ratio. Um, the I'm, I'm working on compiling a lot of this stuff right now, so I'd say LaSalle is the, the ratio is probably like 10 to one. When you get off the plateau, uh, actually you don't even have to go off the plateau. There's a uranium district in Northwestern New Mexico where there's, it's basically flipped. You have a much higher uranium to vanadium content. Um, and then that's more similar to things you see in like Wyoming. Um, and yeah, so the Henry Mountains, yeah, they have very high vanadium to uranium ratios as well. I haven't been out there. Um, I'm aware they exist. I think there's like the Frank M and Tony M ore bodies out there. Uh, those have been extensively studied and would be a good, a good uh, point of comparison uh, uh, for the work that I'll be doing. Oh, I see Dan's up. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, to, uh, thank you both for fantastic talks. I was wondering in the first talk if uh, you felt that the, the uh, deformation that you were observing reflected changes in the uh, angle of subduction over that uh, 30 to 40 million period that you were observing. Yeah, so I think where that might tie in is the relative magnitude of sigma two um, in, in the in the best fit for the overall tectonic stress condition. Um, but I don't, I don't think I've related it with anything directly to do with the subduction angle. Um, but I think maybe that, that relative magnitude of sigma two uh, that might be driven by, by some, some sort of um, you know, combination. I think that the uh, the uh, orientation of subduction changed over time. That's why I was curious about that. The the uh, direction uh, northeast versus east west. Oh yes, okay, okay. Sorry, I was I misinterpreted your question. Yeah. So, and that's something we're actually moving forward with this. I, I want to try and do multiple um, the tests to because you can superimpose multiple stress states and and test that kind of rotating. Uh, sigma one and see if that that produces the best fit to try to test an evolving you know an evolving tectonic stress state with that with that subduction angle changing. Okay, thank you. Vasab, do you want to go next? I do. Yes. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you, Aton. Thank you, Lauren, for a wonderful presentation. Um, Lauren, I'm a mechanical guy through and through, so I really appreciated the stress indicative structural analysis and the mechanical modeling and all. I think both you did a, well, Lauren, you did a fantastic job capturing the shear forces between rocks and Aton, you did an amazing job describing the movement of fluid through these rocks. And I am not a true rock guy. So excuse me if this is a naive question, but this kind of brings me to what I feel is almost the paradox, the paradox basin. Um, would you say, Aton, that you could describe the movement of rocks over time as a fluid itself? In that, could you apply Bernoulli's equation to the surface of the Earth, essentially? 
Is that a dumb question? No, no, that's that's fair. Well, the the thing is, is that uh, as geologists, we we have to think in deep deep time. So, rocks certainly deform. Uh, I guess uh, in in short amounts of time and and probably you're used to things doing like mechanical tests on things where you see it instantaneously. But uh, yeah, when we think in, in longer terms, um, there's certainly deformation of, uh, of rocks that it just happens so slowly. It's almost like flowage, you could say. I mean, you see that deep in, the, in I guess, lower crust where you have metamorphic rocks that are flowing because uh, but they're flowing at such slow rates that it takes geologic time to get them to, to move like that. That was a good question. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. I look forward to more field work and more, more talks. Thanks, you guys. Anyone else got a hand up? I've got a question. I can't seem to get a hand to show up for. Okay, ask. Mike, go ahead. Uh, this is for Aton. Um, I, a number of years ago, I worked out at Tikaboo, which is uh, over in the Henry Mountains. And I was there working at capacity with uh, Schlumberger, a reservoir characterization group. And there were some other companies like Chevron that were also working in the area. Um, but our, our, our primary problem was looking at the salt wash in terms of the complexity of fluid flow uh, through those rocks. And we basically used a lot of the drilling that was done behind the cliff faces and then compared it to what we actually saw in the cliff faces. So I don't know what your connections are to the hydrocarbon industry, but it might be worth looking up somebody like Gus Gustafson or, uh, or maybe somebody out of, the, out of the Chevron groups to see what they came up with in terms of fluid flow in the salt wash. It may just give you some insights, maybe from a slightly different perspective in terms of the mineralization fluids and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great suggestion. Um, yeah, well, the salt wash is so, there's so much heterogeneity in it. I mean, it's yeah. a, a braided fluvial system for the most part. So you get all sorts of different uh, grain sizes stacked on one another. Things range from like mudstones to coarse sandstones. So it's difficult to like create a nice simple uh, fluid flow network because of that. So it seems like there'd be a lot of tortuosity, I guess, to it uh, with those fluids moving around. But also, I mean, it's interesting you brought up the hydrocarbon perspective because when we look at uh, uh, deposits in the Triassic Chinle formation, uh, the bleaching or reducing fluid out there uh, there's really good evidence that uh, they're hydrocarbons. Uh, you get blebs of things out there, lots of bitumen and asphalt and things like that. Um, and those seem to be the things that were able to, to localize uh, uranium mineralization. Yeah, we noticed that as well. There, we, see, we can see or, organic concentrations that seem to have some mineralization, a lot of the bitumen. Um, yeah. Also out of that area, there was a paper that came out that looked, we, we saw a lot of dinosaur trampolites in the, in the salt wash. And there's a paper that came out by Larry Jones and Gus Gustafson that talked about the influence of trails that the dinosaurs would create and their influence on the, mm. on the geometry of the salt wash channels. Mm. They got kicked back a number of times by, you know, paleo specialists and animal specialists, but eventually the paper got out. But it was an interesting perspective just to, consider that there could be a biological influence under channel geometries out there because you got these critters trampling areas and sort of following trails and they you see them in the color you know in Africa and other areas where you have large animals moving about so anyhow appreciate great talks by by both of you enjoy listening to them thank you well if if there are no other questions I guess we should we should wrap it up by thanking our two speakers. Lauren I, I think there's one more, Vince. Oh, is there? Yeah. Um, okay. well, congratulations to both of you on great talks. Uh, but I'd like to ask Lauren just a simple question of uh, what's the basis for the 85 to 40 million year span of the Laramide? I know that in Colorado, a lot of people 
use a shorter span than that, which I don't have to agree with, but can you help me with some? Yeah, um, I mean, I think, I, I know people have different numbers there. And to be honest with you, I don't, I don't have, I don't have a strong opinion, but that, that number I think is mostly based on, um, on thermocron ages on the entire layer mine. Um, so going up into Montana and Wyoming too. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Dan, did you have a last, did you have a question? Yeah, one last question to Aton. Uh, thanks, Aton. It was uh, tremendous. I remember being up at Lisbon Valley when they, they uh, had their one of their initial blasts, and I was aware of the, uh, the grid, the northwest trending and northeast trending structural grid uh, that lined up with the Lisbon Valley deposit and uh, the LaSalle's, and I think that a lot of the, uh, uh, the igneous bodies up there and some of the principal uh, mineralization is on that that grid. Can you speak to that uh, with respect to that that deep structural grid that seems to affect the paradox as well as uh, the uh, depositional environment of the vanadium and uranium? Yeah, I think. Well, I think Lauren would be a better person to ask about uh, structural geology on the Colorado Plateau, but I I can make an attempt at it. If Lauren doesn't want to talk. Um, <laughs> but basically what I've envisioned is that I, I think that uh, the, there's basement structures that have essentially influenced where these salt walls actually formed. Um, and then that was, I guess, amplified by sedimentation later on by things like the Permian Cutler Formation. And then once those things are in place, you know, it sets the stage pretty nicely to create other structures like uh, like the big normal faults that that bound these valleys like in Lisbon Valley where you have down dropping and then and then I guess subsequent uh, copper mineralization that travels up these or copper bearing fluids that travel up these faults and mineralize the surrounding host rock um, I have been out so rattlesnake mine on the western side of uh, the LaSalle district actually is is at the the tip of the Lisbon Valley fault in that structure, um, and uh, I went out there to make sure that they were unrelated because that's what the literature seems to conclude is that these uranium and vanadium deposits are not structurally controlled at all. Um, so I went out there and I took a look at things, and you can see offset from uh, the younger Lisbon Valley fault on these bleached beds. So you can see uh, that there's offset in the previously bleached rocks. Um, so the two may be related, but that evidence would suggest otherwise. Thank you.